Now this tutorial may become quite epic, we've got a lot to cover. And we're going to cover this notion that there are methods and substance, substances which enhance sporting performance. And I would imagine when you see the word enhance, you probably might jump to the fact that some of these are illegal. But bear in mind that some of what we're going to talk about is legal as well. And it could even be considerations for you and your own performances. So bear that one in mind. These are the things that athletes might do to, to give them an edge, I suppose. Now, the first thing we'll do is we'll look at these three categories. Pharmacological, which obviously is like drug, substance-based, physiological process you can do to your body, nutritional, what you can consume. So we're going to look in these three categories. To start off with, and I've done some of the hard work already for us, we're going to start to look at steroids. And this, of course, is a pharmacological structure. And we're talking about a synthetic hormone based around testosterone, that male hormone producing the testes in the brain, far more far greater quantities in men than in women. What does it do? Well, we're going to put into green the advantage. We want this to be an evaluative structure. Well, what it does as a positive is it up arrow increases protein synthesis. So it encourages those little ribosomes that you've studied in GCSE biology to go about their work and produce protein, amongst which could be the tissue of uh, the muscle tissue, the fibers, and the proteins that go into that particular process. This means that we get an up arrow in muscle growth. Now, obviously, if you are a strength power-based athlete, this is gonna be really, really valuable to you. We're also gonna get an up arrow in muscle mass. You know, people literally get bigger. Now, this is if it's combined with training, by the way. If you just sort of knock a load of steroids back, this isn't gonna do that for you. It needs to be in, uh, in um in, uh, with training as well. We're also gonna get improved or better recovery. I'm not saying recovery is taking longer, we recover faster, it's really good for recovery. And finally on the positives, it really up arrows, it increases the intensity and duration of training. So this being a training drug is really effective at maximizing the performance of the components of fitness, for example. But of course, there are some drawbacks to this. It's not all good, right? Well, some of these are that people experience mood swings. We sometimes call those a roid rage. Sounds a bit like road rage, isn't it? But roid rage. They make people aggress aggressive. So we'll put aggression, same sort of point as I just made. They can cause acne, the enemy of a teenager, obviously. And they can cause liver damage. Now, I want to stress here, Athletes who cheat via uh, this illegal method of steroids, they take massive quantities, hence the uh, liver potentially getting damaged. And they can experience a hormonal uh, imbalance, so hormonal damage can occur as well. So that's what we'd refer to as the impact of taking steroids. Be reminded, it is illegal. Now let's go further. We're going to stay with our pharmacological aids. We're looking at erythropoietin here, or RHEPO. RH reflects the nature that this can be done synthetically. That's in this case what the the RH does. What is the beneficial? Very popular with cyclists, for example. So why? Well, the main thing is it causes the production production of RBCs. So erythropoiesis, obviously which is where we get erythropoietin from, erythropoiesis is the process of producing red blood cells. This means that our hematocrit, which is the proportion of the blood that is red blood cells, goes up on average, uh, there would be 45%, it could be up to 50, 55% or more potentially with an athlete using EPO. We're also gonna say that this increases O2 transport. Well, of course that's the case because hemoglobin is there to transport oxygen, right? And a little bit of carbon dioxide on the way back, but it has some negatives, okay? So it can lead to what's called hyperviscosity of the blood. The blood can get particularly thick and sticky and that can cause uh, problems with blood pressure. We also have a need for greater blood, blood plasma. So they might need a further treatment to actually increase the plasma volume of the blood. Now, what this can do as a whole is it can down arrow, it can decrease stroke volume because you know it's a sticky, a more solid substance, and it can, in extreme cases, lead to clot. So obviously, this is a concern, an EPO, extremely popular, especially in the 90s and 2000s in endurance cycling. It's uh, it, it's something that you know. It, it, it's highly illegal in sport. Now, HGH, human growth hormone, it's naturally occurring. It decreases with age, which is obviously why you know less growth occurs with age, for example. But why would people take it? Well, 
it up arrow increases protein synthesis. Remember those ribosomes I mentioned before? Well, of course, this is going to be useful for like power athletes, isn't it? We're going to get up arrow muscle growth. We've seen this with the steroids, very similar kind of impact here. We're talking about an up arrow increased muscle mass. Again, very synonymous with our steroid type effect. But what else will this do? It will also up arrow increase fat metabolism. Okay, so that means that we can actually process fats more efficiently and maybe at a higher intensity of exercise. We also increase our blood glucose level. So we're able to transport more glucose within the blood. Glucose obviously being the energy providing substance being moved into cells. And it also can aid recovery. So again, these are all really helpful for a power athlete type individual, but there are naturally drawbacks. So why should somebody be careful with this? they might experience abnormal bone growth. Okay, this is not just growth hormone for muscle tissue. This could make bones grab normally. We might get enlarged organs, which of course is not what we are looking for. This is inefficient and is not health healthy. We might also experience diabetes. And of course, this in this sense would be type two diabetes, lifestyle diabetes as a result of you know taking the substance. So what we've got there is we've got three pharmacological aids, all of which have their strengths, their weaknesses and their level of legality. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna to switch to these physiological aids. And the first thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at blood doping. So blood doping, here's our description. <laughs> blood doping here's our description of the process it's a transfusion we remove blood one and by the way i'm saying we i've never done this clearly we remove one to four well, weeks before we need this boost in uh in oxygen carrying capacity we separate the red blood cells out from the extracted blood we then store it in frozen conditions and we retransfuse in saline okay so effectively we're, we're building the blood back in the interim period and of course, then when we add the red blood cells back in, we've got a higher hematocrit. So what we're saying is very, very similar to our EPO, more red blood cells. We've got therefore a higher hematocrit, hematocrit. So we've got a higher hematocrit. This means that we've got increased hemoglobin, of course. It means that when we're exercising, we can delay fatigue. So because we have blood dope, perhaps uh, the night before, uh, Tour de France cycling stage, I don't know why I choose that example. Um, it's going to help us delay fatigue on the following day. But negatives, it increases blood viscosity. We mentioned hyperviscosity early, didn't we? Same sort of, uh, exactly the same concept there. We're also, we've got the potential for infections because obviously this is transfusion based, needles based. That's really only if needles get shared, but nevertheless, it's not ideal. And we also get a decrease, we get a decrease Q or decreased cardiac output because that thicker blood is being processed. Now, next one we're going to have a look at here. This is what's called IHT, okay, IHT. And IHT is intermittent hypoxic training. Let me actually write that in for you intermittent that means on and off hypoxic this means at altitude conditions training so that's what this is now these people are not going to altitude they're wearing a face mask with a tank and actually replicating altitude conditions why would they do this well because it's like altitude and it could be used, it could be used to acclimatize for example to altitude guess what we're going to see here we get more red blood cells we get more HB, HB is hemoglobin by the way. We might therefore, or we will therefore, get increased O2 transport. So we're better able to move O2 around in our blood. This is going to lead to some of the following impacts. We might delay obla, okay? So we reach fatigue at a higher intensity of exercise. Um, and we might also get an increased buffering capacity, but of course there's negatives here as well. It's temporary, okay? It doesn't last. Once you're back in the real world, the real world, you adapt to that, it's tedious. And the other point I'd say here is it's not natural, okay? So this is completely legal, by the way, if it can be afforded, but these are some of the criticisms of, of the method. It has, it's also been um, suggested that it leads to dehydration in people, um, which might be a bit of an issue. And it also might lead to less down arrow immunity people's immune system seems to suffer through IHT. So that's something to be aware of. Now we're gonna finish off our um, uh, physiological methods by looking at things like cooling age, ice baths, cold wrap towels, ice baths, cryotherapy. Why would this 
be useful for people? Why would we go about doing this? And we do this, by the way, both, um, we could do this pre-event, we could do this because of injury, we could do it post-event. Well, a couple of things. It will decrease what's called CV drift. I'm not sure if you've studied that already, but CV drift is where our heart rate naturally grows high because we're getting a little bit more dehydrated in hot conditions. It's going to decrease overheating, which of course is really helpful for us, especially if we do this before and potentially during. Um, it's also gonna decrease dehydration. So these are all really beneficial effects. But this also as well, um, uh, let me put one other in here, decreased thermal strain. Thermal strain is that additional energy requirement when competing in hot conditions. Now, we've also got the idea here that from an injury perspective and a post-event perspective, we could also get uh, decreased inflammation, okay? So we might get decreased inflammation. So things like, you know, joints might swell less, for example. We might, let's actually put that decrease down arrow swelling. Think about this with injury, you know, ice packs are a good example. And then sort of post-event, we might also get things like prevent DOMS, okay? So delayed onset of muscle soreness. If we use something like ice baths cryotherapy, it may well be the case that we can prevent DOMS from happening. We might expect that we get fewer injuries because we're recovering better in this environment, but there are negatives. We might experience ice burns. Okay, it's not pleasant, of course we might get mask injuries. And what I mean by, oh, sorry, what we might get mask injuries. What I mean by that is we might mask injuries. There might actually be something wrong, but the eye sort of takes away the sort of sensation that that's actually something wrong. And of course, this is not for the elderly. We don't want to be wrapping elderly people in freezing cold jackets or whatever the equivalent is, right? That's not a good idea. Now to finish this off, and you might be thinking, Flippin' Egg James, already a really long tutorial. And by the way, I'm not sure if I'm gonna break this tutorial into two, I might. 